day in and day out, I meet people who love gardening. And one of the common things I hear them say is that they're happiest when they're surrounded by their plants and they'd love to be able to spend all their time with them. There's a few people who are fortunate enough to turn that dream into a reality. Here's someone who's doing just that, living the dream. More than anything, I think I'm driven by curiosity. The only reason why I want answers to my questions is so I can move on to bigger and better questions. I'm Michael McCoy. I'm a garden designer, an author, and a blogger. And I'm the host of Dream Gardens on the ABC. I live with my family in the Macedon Ranges in Victoria, where we are the custodians of a 100-year-old oak tree. So part of my role as a tour guide is to visit other people's gardens and also on the TV show. But my own is not at all about showing off. It's all about experimenting and doing the stuff that I love the most. I have a real passion for really tall, plants of dramatic seasonal interest. I love being swallowed up in summer growth that then comes crashing down in over winter. I love that kind of um, seasonal exaggeration. After 10 years or so of being addicted to height, I started to want to or crave to be able to find a place where I could use low plants, things that were knee height or lower. And I'd never had a kind of uh, a form that would allow me to do that before. So I developed this idea of this step garden. And step is a word that describes a flora of places with really dry summer, really cold winter and high winds. So brutal kind of environment. The plants are therefore of really strong shapes. And so in this case, I'm basically creating a carpet of different shapes and forms and colors but in order to not just feel like I'm on the garden, but in it, I've got a double row of Italian cypress that are cut exactly at my head height. And then the whole thing is just punctured by Stiper gigantea here, the golden oats grass that sits at just above my head height so that I feel totally embraced in the space, beautifully defined inside the space, but allows everything else to just become a carpet. Michael is one of Australia's most successful garden designers. But the reasons he became one have their origins in tragedy. Someone had told me in my high school years that I was going to end up being a gardener. I, I, I just would have laughed and would have seriously questioned. It, there was no correlation, I guess, between what I knew and loved then and then what happened almost overnight, age 17, nearly 18 over Christmas holidays between finishing my HSC year and starting uni. My father went through a series of botched operations which put him into ICU over a period of about four to six weeks, just slowly descended and eventually died. While dealing with his grief, Michael's path was changed by a simple cutting in his mother's kitchen. I was driving my mother into hospital every day to, to visit him. And at that stage, she had a glass of water on the kitchen windowsill with some cuttings in it. And these things were sprouting roots in a clear glass of water. And this just really fascinated me that a piece of a living organism could become self-supporting. You could break a piece off of something, stick it in a glass of water, and that it could turn into a self-supporting organism. Michael's fascination led to him studying botany and science, and then hands-on experience as a gardening apprentice at the Ripon Lee Estate in Melbourne. But Michael was beginning to question whether he'd actually made a big mistake in his choice of career. So during that time, I was given two books from a friend who was attempting to assist with this short-term depression and disillusionment about gardening. So I flip open this book and start reading and find 
this massive window opened to me. My, my future suddenly clarified. It was a book called The Adventurous Gardener by Christopher Lloyd. From that moment, he became my guru and my hero, and I got hold of anything I could find written by him. So in 1989, Christopher Lloyd came to a conference in Melbourne with a range of extraordinary speakers from around the world. And so I got to meet him there. And he said, good to meet you, come and visit me socially sometime at Dixter. So as it happened over time, things evolved. I ended up planning to go away. Christopher Lloyd got wind of this and said, why don't you come and work for me during that time? And you may as well come and stay here at Dixter and live with me at Dixter while you do so. I've described it as being like a musician living with Mozart or a painter with Picasso. Just for me to have a chance to meet and hang out with and then live with the person whose thinking I admired and wanted to emulate more than anybody else's was just extraordinary. After Great Dixter, Michael returned to Australia to perhaps the most important job of his life. 14 years ago, my wife and I did a role swap and she went back to work full time. My work is multifaceted, but also highly flexible, mostly. She is now the principal of a little independent school and I have been the primary caregiver for my kids. And that's been a fantastic time. There's a wonderful simplification around the messiness of parenting life that just comes about the fact that basically every day, no matter what else you've got on, you know you've got one job to do properly. If at the end of the day you've only done one thing properly, it's your parenting. And so that has been a real privilege for me for the last 14 years. So there was a moment right at my dad's passing and that little glass with the cutting on the windowsill that changed my life forever. I think gardening has me firmly in its grip and it's never gonna let me go.